This evening, we are continuing in a lesson that we began this morning looking at the question, what does the Bible say about heaven? What does the Bible say about heaven? I had stated that this was the last lesson in the series, and originally, when I had planned this particular topic, it was supposed to be, what does the Bible say about heaven and hell? I decided because of the, the, the length of the material that we had that it'd be better just to end the series on what does the Bible say about heaven. But since hell is such a hot topic, we might do one more lesson before the year is out focusing on what does the Bible teach about hell. And I think really that would probably be a good thing to do. Because we talked about angels and demons last week or in, in, the, in the previous lesson. And it'd be good to, to end the series with that. So we may yet have one more lesson in this series of lessons. This morning, though, as we were talking about what the Bible says about heaven, we showed or answered, at least attempted to answer, what does the Bible say regarding where and what heaven is. For instance, we showed that heaven is a spiritual abode awaiting those who are faithful. The point is, it is a spiritual abode abode, a house not made with hands, prepared for us by God. And that if we will listen to what the Bible teach and have faith in its testimony of our eternal abode in heaven, then we will spend eternity in heaven. We also made the point that heaven is not physical, it is not earthly, but is that which is spiritual, that which God has prepared Everything which is physical will be destroyed, leaving only that which is spiritual. We then looked at the question, what will be found in heaven? And some of the, the who of will we find in heaven, we talked about God. We talked about Jesus Christ being in heaven. The Holy Spirit being in heaven as well. We talked about the angels being in heaven. But then in looking at the what is found in heaven, we talked about our reward, the reward of the faithful being in heaven. We also showed that the spiritual treasures of Christians are found in heaven. This evening we resume in this same way of thinking what will be found in heaven. And going along with the reward of the faithful in our treasures, we find that our names, our names are recorded in heaven. Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 10 verse 20. We see two references here. The first one's found in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, where Jesus makes the point, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, but the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Jesus clearly tells them to rejoice because their names are written in heaven. Turning over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 23. Note there with me the Hebrew writer. He says in Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now I'm not going to pretend to be able to even understand how they are recorded, but we know that our names are there, that we are known there, that we are in a manner of speaking registered there, in heaven, known by God, because we are seeking to faithfully follow Him. But we also find that heaven is where our hope lies. Turning over to Paul's letter to the church in Colossians, in Colossians chapter 1. Notice with me there in Colossians 1, verses 3 through 6. He says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it is also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Our hope, our hope lies within heaven. We look forward to that time that we will be able to spend eternity with God in heaven. It is that hope. It is that hope that keeps us going, that hope that keeps us persevering, the hope that keeps us keeping on. To the church in Philippians, in, or Philippi, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul references another thing that we find in heaven. 
In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we all so eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've talked about that several times here. How that our citizenship lies within heaven. That when you became a Christian, you became a stranger here, a foreigner, if you would, in a strange land. A sojourner. Because your citizenship now lies in heaven. But we also find there's one more thing that we're going to talk about that is found within heaven. And this one is found in 1 Peter chapter 1. Along the same lines as our hope, along the same lines as our names being registered in heaven, we find that our inheritance awaits for us. Notice in 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's begin reading in verse 3 or we'll read verses 3 and 4. Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice the living hope. He says in verse 4, He has begotten us to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Many times when you think about an inheritance in physical terms, you think about something that truly is temporary and oftentimes misused. You know, they were talking about the, the, the big lottery that was being played recently. And they were talking about the, the, the number of people who are cursed when they win the lottery because they end up almost in a worse state than they were when they won the lottery. Well, the same thing happens with inheritance. You know, if, if you're one of these individuals who's due to inherit a large amount of money, you have to exercise wisdom because it will be gone at some point. And how you manage it will determine how you make the best use of it. But even so, with that inheritance, one day you die and someone else will inherit it from you. This inheritance, he says, though, is incorruptible. As long as you faithfully serve God and follow after his word, this inheritance being incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away, will be reserved for us in heaven. And the fact that the Bible tells us this is enough for us because we believe it. And with that, we have an anchor that keeps us faithfully tethered to our heavenly father in service unto him. Which then brings us then to the last question for the lesson. Who will spend eternity in heaven? I like to be able to tell you that as long as you are morally good, that you'll spend eternity in heaven. And that's kind of the way the world looks at it. Years ago, before I started preaching, I was, went over to the house of a local preacher. And there were two individuals from the Latter-day Saints sitting there talking to him. Now, in the Latter-day Saints' teaching, they believe in three different levels of, I don't want to say so much of heaven, but, you know, you've got the top level and then the second level and the third level. And even those individuals who are murderers and whoremongers, they will spend a time in a temporary jail, if you would, punishment, to be judged, and then they'll still come out of that to the lower level, if I remember the teachings properly. Well, in our discussion with them, we asked them, or more I should say, they asked us about our belief regarding hell. And, and, and no, actually, we asked them first, well, where, where do you think we will be, non-Latter-day Saints? And they said, well, you know, you're good people and you believe in God. So you're going to probably be at, at the, the low level. Maybe the middle one, but definitely probably the, the low level one. So, okay, kind of comforting. And then they said, how about us? The preacher said, well, anyone who doesn't follow what the Bible teaches, they're going to spend eternity in hell. The other one piped up, well, we think you're going to spend eternity in hell too. Now, here's my point. I would have loved to have been able to say to them, you know what? You believe in God too. And you profess a belief in Jesus Christ. You take a different approach regarding things. 
but that's okay with God. I'd love to be able to say that to people. But God does not set that standard. His standard is much higher. His standard is that those who are prepared when he comes again will be the ones to spend eternity in heaven. This preparedness we see kind of spelled out for us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning there in verse 15. This was a passage we had used for us in our scripture reading earlier. Here in providing comfort to the brethren, regarding those brethren who had already died, he says to them in verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Now notice, he says that we who are alive and remaining, the we is talking about faithful Christians, talking about those who are faithfully following God. And I'll show you a, a, an opposite side to this here in just a moment that supports that. He says in verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together in him, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So notice, notice what he says here in the passage here. The Lord is going to send from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ. Those who had lived faithfully unto God and were in fellowship with Christ when they died. Then we who are living, we who are alive, we Christians who are alive and remain will be caught up. I have no idea what that's going to be like. But the way it describes it, you're going to be standing and then you're going to be called up. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we'll always be with the Lord. But in order for us to get to that point, we have to be in the Lord. We have to be faithful unto the Lord. We have to be those in fellowship with the Lord. Now, let's kind of turn the coin over a little bit and turn in your Bibles, and this one's not on the chart behind me, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Notice there in verse 6. He says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Now look at the contrast. On one side of the coin, he's coming with his angels in, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God and on those who did not obey the gospel. But over here on the other side of the coin, we have those who will rise up to meet him. Or if they're already dead, they will return, in a manner of speaking, with him when he comes again. So if the ones over here who are punished because they did not obey the gospel, it is necessarily implied that those who are received by the Lord done so, did, were so, or were done so, whichever, because they knew the Lord, because they obeyed the Lord. The opposite sends these people down to hell, and the, uh, the opposite here sends these people up to heaven. But only if we're prepared only if we know the Lord, only if we have obeyed the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't half-heartedly do this. Being a member of the church isn't being the member of some social club where you go and have fun with people and maybe you have your membership card stamped. Being a member of the body of Christ is a life. It's a way of life, the way of thinking, the way that we Formulate the goals within our life. As a matter of fact, it can be summed up by what Jesus said in Mark chapter 12. Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. Who else or who will spend eternity in heaven 
Well, those who do what we're about to read, beginning in Mark 12, verse 29. Here we read, they had asked the question, which is the first commandment? So to this, Jesus replies, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Now, one of the things we need to take note of is that this was stated initially to the people of Israel in the book of Leviticus and then in the book of Deuteronomy to the second generation. That people of Israel who were under the Mosaical law, God still expected them to love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what God expected of them then, and they failed to do that. They rejected him and his covenant, and he rejected them. We now have a new covenant. And under this new covenant, God still expects us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. And Mark's gospel adds, with all our strength. Now that is the sum total of who we are, is it not? Should that not dictate and determine everything that we say? Everything that we do, every decision that we make within our life, our priorities and our desires and our wishes and all that, should not this alter and change and affect who we are? There will be no one in heaven who did not love the Lord their God while on this earth with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. There will be no one who's half devoted to Christ in heaven. There'll be no one who is a half-hearted Christian in heaven. You know, it's interesting about the political world and just about any, type, any, any, um, any, any um, great cause that there might be. You're always going to have some people who are wholeheartedly have put themselves into that cause. But then you're going to have someone who goes according to the cause because it seems like the right thing to do. Or because this person or that person is doing it. There have been individuals to change political parties depending on which way the power shifted. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 11 and reading down there, he, he tells us that we are equipped so that we do not become like children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. There will be no one in heaven who's wishy-washy regarding faith in Christ. We must love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. That's how we go to heaven. But the only way that we can accomplish this, and for those of you who are in the Sunday morning adult class out here, you know what's coming next. We have to submit ourselves unto God. We have to totally and completely, without reservation and without holding anything back, submit ourselves unto God. Turn with me to James chapter 4, if you would. James chapter 4, and follow along in your Bibles as we begin reading in verse 7. We'll read down through verse 10. James says, therefore, submit to God. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. The writer here is telling the brethren that they have to be willing to submit unto God in order to overcome the devil. They have to draw near unto God and resist the devil in order to overcome the devil. Now, if we follow the devil, we spend eternity in hell. But if we submit ourselves unto God and we draw near unto God, God, God will draw near unto us. And by so doing, we will put ourselves on the path that leads to eternity in heaven. For those who are choosing to walk in sin, he says, lament, mourn, and weep. Turn away and repent. It's kind of the idea there. But for the one who chooses to draw near unto God, then they can do as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3. Instead of mourning and weeping, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse um, 10 there, he says, for he who would love life and see good days. As Christians, we don't have to mourn. We don't have to weep in sorrow. We no longer have 
to fear. In reading the story of Esther, preparing for the, the transition in our Tuesday morning class, when Mordecai heard about Haman getting the king to sign a decree that would have all of the children of Israel put to death, all the Jews put to death, Mordecai wept and he mourned and he, he sat in, 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 in sackcloth and ashes and fasted. Brethren, as long as we are faithfully following God, we never have to go through that. Because nothing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. We can love life and see good days by refraining our tongues from evil and our lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil, verse 11 says, and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You see... We can spend eternity in heaven, but we've got to submit to the leader. I remember as a child playing the game Follow the Leader, and the whole point behind that game was to, if you got to be the front guy, then you had to do anything possible to get the other people not to do it. Climb in a garbage can or, or, or call over a car, do something really stupid. And everybody who's supposed to follow you and do that. Well, thankfully... Our Heavenly Father will never lead us astray. And this is something that we cannot turn away from. That we have to submit and humble ourselves unto Him and follow Him. And if we do this, then what happens within our lives is a transformation. Is a transformation. We've referenced this off and on through the course of the lesson. Of the need of changing the, down to the very heart of who we are. To the very way that we think. And Paul, in writing to the church in Rome, references this in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You want to look like the world and act like the world, that's a confirmation. You're conforming to the world. But if you want to be different from the world and different from the life of sin, then you have to be transformed. And he says this transformation takes place by the renewing of your mind. What's one of the hardest things to change about an individual? The way they think. The way their mind has been shaped whether it be by nurture or by nature. And if their mindset has been such for the last 50 years, trying to get them to think differently is going to be seemingly impossible. There are some people who still believe that we never did walk on the moon. And who knows, maybe we didn't. But people, no matter what you say and show to them, and no matter what they say and show to us, will just never change. Because once the mind is set, it's a hard thing to change. But I'm telling you what, when our minds change, it changes who we are. Whether it be a habit, whether it be a practice, whether it be something ungodly or unholy, when we finally change the very center of who we are and the thought processes, then it changes the whole of our life. The words that we say, the decisions that we make, the things that we do. That's why he tells us there to no longer be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God's will, Peter says, that none should perish, but that all should have eternal life. And you'll prove that will true if you'll conform to, if you'll transform yourself to God tonight. If you'll do that, go through this transformation. If you'll go through everything we've talked about, you'll be only one of a few. It's what the Bible teaches us. Notice with me. There's three passages from Matthew we're going to look at here. But only the few will be found in heaven. I'd love to be able to tell you that in the majority of the history of mankind, that the majority of mankind will be in heaven. But even Jesus says that's not going to happen. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, beginning there in verse 13. What does Jesus say? He says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, 
And broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. This is what the Bible tells us. There will only be a few who find it. He doesn't make it mysterious, and it's no longer a mystery. It has now been revealed to us. And he doesn't make it difficult. We're the ones who make it difficult. The problem is when we choose to follow the world, the world will go through the easy gate, the broad gate. But if we choose to follow God, then we will be part of the few who finds the way that leads to life. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 16, Jesus says, So the last will be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. Let's think about that in a modern day example here. Telemarketers. It's their job. Okay, what they do, they do to earn money, and it's their job. And so they have to call a lot and lot of people. When I was in high school for a short time, I worked for this, this seasonal thing that we were trying to call people and raise money for some, for some nursing home or something. I don't remember now what it was. And they gave me a page out of the phone book here. It says, call everybody on this. So I was one of those people that you don't want to answer, and I don't want to answer. And so I remember calling them and talking to them. And probably only maybe just a handful of, I got tired of the job really quick, by the way. But just a handful of them ever accepted and said, sure, we'll, 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 we'll help out. God calls everyone through the gospel. Unfortunately, they hang up, if you would. They reject, they refuse to take the call to listen to the word. And as a result, only a few. The last will be first, the first will be last, for many are called, but few are chosen. And then lastly, Matthew twenty two fourteen, as you see behind me. For many, many, many people are called, but only a few are chosen. The question for you and I tonight is, are we of the few? If we have been faithfully following God, then yes, we are. And heaven is prepared for us. And we live our lives with, that, with hope in eternity in heaven, faithfully following God. Now, this is not an elite group, though. When I say few are chosen, it doesn't mean that it's an elite group that you can't go teach anybody. We're to be spreading the word to the world to try to bring people to Christ so that they, too, may spend eternity in heaven, that eternal abode, that spiritual abode, that inheritance of the saints prepared for those who faithfully follow the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian, the path that you're on currently will not lead to heaven. The way of thinking, the way of behavior will not lead to heaven, but it will lead to hell. But you're still breathing. You're still with us here this evening and you still have time. And it's God's will that you obey the gospel. It is God's desire that you listen to the word. If you've studied the Bible at all, and you have a measure of understanding, then let us sit down and study with you some more. Let us walk with you through the pages of the Bible and show you why you should believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Show you why you should believe that he died for your sins. Show you why you should believe that without the forgiveness of the sins you will be lost. And to show you that Jesus says that you need to believe and be baptized in order to be saved. Mark 16, 16. That you need to repent of your sins and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 2, verse 38 that you need to make the decision tonight to answer that gospel's call. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. Why not? Think of everything that waits on the other side of death. Why give that up for a moment of pleasure? Moses was unwilling to do that. Moses chose to suffer with his people rather than to enjoy the momentary pleasure of sin. Let us choose to set our lives right with God tonight. If you're a Christian and you've fallen away, let's turn back. Change your mind and come back to him tonight. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, would you come forward now as we stand and as we sing?